A very good evening to each one of you and welcome to the disputation. Uh, my name is Kuzwayo Tembo and I'm just going to give a brief background uh, to this just as a way of welcome. If you can't hear me, please send a message in the chat room and someone will notify me uh, of, of that. Thank you. All right, so like I said, I'd like to just take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to this first episode of the disputation. Um, Basically, just a brief background. Disputation is a word that is taken from the Latin phrase disputato. Uh, now, it is a form of academic discourse or debate uh, that largely originated around the 15th century uh, AD. Uh, and it was a way in which scholars, mostly in universities, uh, would defend their theses uh, on particular subjects. Uh, so these were formal academic discussions uh, between scholars who had, who had opposing views on particular subjects. And they were required to give a public defense um, based on reference, references to uh, authorities in, in writing. Uh, also, uh, also just by the use of appeal to logic. Um, now, you may be wondering why this is essential um, today. But in this 21st century, even here in Zambia, I think one thing we can say for sure is that social media has made it very easy for everyone to share their opinion at the click of a button on every subject that, that is trending. At a particular time um, and in such a world where very few people are faced with the burden to prove or defend their positions um, it's easy to forget that truth is actually essential um, and so this platform uh, is simply an initiative where we would like to provide an opportunity to just pause for a moment and to critically think um, and discuss important subjects and, and it's our hope that even as we hold more discussions like these um, will be prompted to further probe uh, for the truth and just for clarity on these many issues that are affecting us. Uh, and so with this brief background, I'd just like to welcome each one of you once again. Um, we received a very overwhelming response for this first debate um, and it's basically humbling. So thank you very much for everyone who's, who's come through and will be attending this. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand over to our moderator, uh, Koza Gomile. Uh, he will lead us through today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kuzwayo. For those of you who are just joining in the conversation, I would like you to tap your screens and mute your microphones. So the option for muting your microphone is just at the le bottom left of your screen. You mute your microphones and turn off stop your video option. So there's, a bot there's an option just next to the mute your microphone you where you press and you stop your video. That will help us uh, with our internet speed as well as you listening into the debate. So if you could stop your video for now, and when I call upon the audience to give questions, I will ask you and I'll call you by name to join into the conversation and you'll be able to ask questions. Until then, kindly mute your microphones and stop your videos. Welcome to the first episode of Disputation. My name is Koza Gomile, as Kuzwayo mentioned. I would like to run you through the program and I won't talk much because I'm sure I'm not here to listen to a guy just talk about the program. We're here to listen to the debates. So let me run you through our discussion for the evening and then we'll begin our debates and introduce our panels and highlight what it is that we're discussing this evening. So for the first session each speaker will be given three minutes from each team as an opening statement so each team will have three minutes to give us an opening statement. They will have exactly five minutes to give us their main argument. Each speaker will have five minutes and then we'll have rebuttals for three minutes so when they're giving us their main arguments no speaker is allowed to rebuttal issue a point of order or make a correction about the, what the other speaker is saying. Rebuttals will be made where the speakers can issue their opinions and issue rebuttals to exactly what the main speaker was speaking about in their point. We'll have, give each speaker three minutes. We'll have cross-examination of each speaker's point and this will be for seven minutes and then we'll have a question and answer session for the audience. Now let me give some ground rules for the question and answer session. If you have a question as a speaker is speaking, kindly click your screen. At the bottom, there's a more option, and then there's the chat. 
So in that chat room, that's where you can be able to send all the questions that you would like us to take a look at. If you'd like to ask a question live to the speaker, you wait for that time and you click the more option once again, and you raise your hand. Do not turn on your microphone until you are called upon after you've clicked the more option and raised your hand. Okay, I hope that's clear. If you have any questions, please click the chat option. I'm sure Cause Wild can assist by responding to them. So let me introduce our team, then I'll introduce the motion. So our first speaker from the proposing team is Mwansa Mbewe. He's an architect, a TED Talk speaker, passionate about Christians and uh, passionate passionate about Christianity and reaching Christians through the media. Mwansa, welcome to the discussion. Thank you, Koza. Good to be here. Our second speaker from the proposing team is Freddie Temple. He's a lawyer, an artist, and he's pragmatic and very unafraid of speaking his mind. Freddie, welcome to the discussion. Thank you, Koza. Yeah. The people who will be, who'll be opposing the motion are Henry Chiwoto. Now, this is a man who's a man's man. Henry Chiwoto is executive director of the Humanity Challenge Organization, a Mandela Washington fellow, an enthusiastic entrepreneur. Henry Chiwoto. Hello. Hi, hi. Good to hi, be here. Henry. Are, the, are you the person everyone should be afraid of? Well, let's wait and see. <laughs> That's where I'm saying. <laughs> Welcome, Henry. Unfortunately, Amina Kaunda couldn't be with us. She was one of our panelists on the opposing team. But do not worry, we did have a backup plan for that one. Um, Kasewe Banda joins us. He's a lawyer and an avid reader about the world and its current affairs. Kasewe Banda, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So, what exactly are we here to discuss? That's the big question. The motion has been sent to you. But let's give you a brief background on where it all began. On 31st December 2019, China reported a cluster of cases of a virus in Hubei province. The World Health Organization reported as of 30th January that there were over 7,000 cases of confirmed coronavirus worldwide, with the majority of these cases being in China and 18 other countries. A risk of high assessment was given to people across the world. By March 2020, deep concerned, deeply concerned by the alarming levels of the spread and the severity, by the levels of the inaction, the World Health Organization assessment and provided a characteristic and characterized the coronavirus as a serious pandemic. Today, over 3.2 million cases have been reported. Over 230 deaths have been reported worldwide. However, only 1 million, only 1 million patients have recovered. Amidst all of this, the world's governments and its leaders initiated measures to ensure that the coronavirus spread was mitigated. Some of these were full lockdowns across the world and semi-lockdowns. From Western to Southern and Eastern continents, Africa was not excluded. And in certain parts of Africa, full and semi-lockdowns were initiated. However, this has caused significant economic impacts to the countries what some economists are calling the greatest recession in modern history. So that begs the question to ask, was the response to the coronavirus sufficient to what the threat it gives to the world? And was it necessary to ensure that some of these semi or full lockdowns needed to be implemented? That leads us to our motion today, which the motion is, false alarm, the global response to COVID-19 is disproportionate to its threat. Let's get straight into it. I'll invite the proposers to give us their first argument. You have exactly three minutes. All right, thank you, Koza. Um, we will be proposing to the motion, which states, for Salam, the global response to COVID-19 is disproportionate to the threat it poses. And in our arguments today, we'll be talking about how um, COVID-19 has been uh, mystified or called the boogeyman and how supposedly it's killing so many people but in relation to other things, other plagues that we've had in the past, uh, it, it doesn't even come close. We will talk about how uh, there is COVID-19 because of the measures that have been taken in place has shifted our, our attention to most of the things that are happening in the background 
uh, abuse of power, um, people dying of other diseases because all of our attention has been shifted to COVID-19. It's the effect of lockdowns and semi lockdowns on, 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 on third world nations like ours um, and why and what term, what long term effects COVID has uh, will have. What term, what long term effects the measures that are being implemented because we're so scared of COVID have, uh, and we all intend to show the the threat is not as 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 crazy and as bad as the measures that are being put in place, and the side effects of the measures that are there now. I hope that was under three minutes. It definitely was. Um, that was a very good opening argument. Um, the opposing team, your time starts now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasant uh, good evening to all the viewers watching us across the world. And uh, our team will be opposing the motion, which reads, for the sake of those who just joined us, the global response to COVID-19 is disproportionate to its threat. In our debate this evening, we will raise a number of arguments showing that our response is actually proportionate to what's going on. We will seek to show exactly where coronavirus has come from. We will seek to demystify some myths and concerns around coronavirus. We will seek to show that we need to treat this with the utmost agency it deserves. In our argument, we will seek to show that when we're on unfamiliar territory, where when we're in uncharted territory and we're not familiar with our enemies, it's our, it's our chance, it's our duty to make sure that we don't take our enemy for granted and muzzle all our strength to fight against this pandemic. We're going to show in our arguments that uh, this coronavirus is not a new thing in itself because we've had other pandemics in the world and that people have said, historians have recorded and will show uh, with facts that in every century there is uh, a great uh, outbreak that takes over the whole globe and becomes a pandemic. And for our generation, that pandemic happens to be coronavirus. And if we as a people do not take this uh, virus very serious, if we don't uh, put our alarm at the highest level, if we don't uh, close our borders, it means that we might be wiped out. Also, in our argument, we'll show the exact responses that the government of Zambia has taken, but also seek to show what the global world has taken in uh, keeping this coronavirus. And we'll conclude with showing the threats and draw that link to make sure that everyone, by the time the debate is done, will see that we're not fighting a boogeyman, a phantom boogeyman, as uh, Freddy has called it. And you see, Freddy is not the only one who's called it a phantom boogeyman. You have 30 seconds left. Uh, thank you. Dabon Becky, the former president of South Africa, called HIV AIDS the phantom boogeyman. And look where we are today. Rest my case. Thank you. So we're going to the second half of our, we're going to the second half of our debate. The opening statements have been done. And each team now will be given five minutes to present their main arguments. I'll invite the proposing team to begin with your first five minutes. Okay. Um, we, we are proposing to the motion, which is, I've already stated, and we'll begin by showing you one, some of the effects uh, of the coronavirus by looking at the Sampo district or province of Hubei, one of the worst hit provinces in China, the number of people that have died. So in Hubei, which has, oh, let's, 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 let's start with China itself. China has a population of 1.3 billion people. In that population of 1.3 billion people, slightly over 3,500 people have died from COVID. Now, in the same period, China recorded 2.5 million deaths of people based on non-corona-related uh, incidents. So everyday lives, 2.5 million people died in China. Uh, but you're not hearing that uh, in the news. Nobody's telling you about the 
five million people that have died, and I'm just focusing on the 3,500 plus. Now let's go to Hubei. Hubei has got a population of 59 million people. In that population, slightly over 3,000 people have died. In the same province, 86,000 people have died from non-corona related diseases. In Hubei itself, um, you will find that people infected with corona, that's whether you die or not, the people infected with the, the virus is 67,794,000 from a population of 59.17 million. Now, the people that have died, as, as I have said, is just slightly north of 3,000, 3, that's 3,085. That's the ratio of the population of 0 0.005 of the population. Now, when we look at ordinary mortality rate in comparison with the coronavirus, you will find that you are four times more likely to die from any other causes than the coronavirus. The mortality in the virus, as I've stated, we're, we're taking Hubei, the worst hit province, worst case scenario, at 0.005%. Now, stay with me here. You're four times more likely to die from anything else. If you are aged 40 and above, your mortality rate percentage is at 0 0.4. If you're 50 and above, 1.4, 1.3%. 1 if you're 60 and above, 3.6. If you're 70 and above, 80.8.0. If you're 80 and above, that's 14.8. Now, the citizens of these worst hit provinces in China put together are 500 times more likely to die from anything else other than COVID. This is what you're not being told about how uh, a crazy you are susceptible to die from, from other things. And let's also take into consideration that there are people, it's not everybody who, who has the coronavirus. And not everybody is infected with it. it. It's spreading rapidly, but not everyone has it. Now, let's, 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 let's consider the COVID in relation to other diseases. The Black Plague killed 20 million people. Smallpox killed 56 million people. Uh, HIV and AIDS has killed close to 25, 20, between 25 and 35 million people. Uh, swine flu has killed more people than the coronavirus. Yet, because this thing has been publicized by the media, everybody is talking about it, we are so afraid. And we're locking up uh, our borders, we're, we're in the house and things like that. Not taking into consideration the fact that the people that are having the virus and are surviving, the people that are having it and are getting cured, even here in Zambia. Let's bring it home. In Zambia, people died of corona more than COVID. We had 300 North people dying in the year 2018, but none of these measures were taken. Now with COVID, we have three deaths, and now we cannot meet in church, we cannot do ABCDFD, but when we had a disease that was affecting us to the core, we couldn't do anything. Now, when you go to the hospitals now, people are turning people away because they really want to attend to the COVID patients. A study in the UK says, because of the response to COVID and, and, and everything that's going on, it is estimated that 18,000 people diagnosed with cancer will die because they're not receiving the proper treatment. Now, what I'm saying is we shouldn't respond to COVID absolutely, but what I'm trying to show you is COVID is not as crazy and as bad as you think it is in comparison to other things that would kill us. In America alone, you're susceptible to die over a number of things, diabetes, suicide, cancer, and et cetera, et cetera. COVID ranks the list among us, the death, uh, the cause of, the, what would cause death in, in our society. In conclusion, this is what I'm, I'm gonna say. The lockdowns, especially here, in the third world country have had so much effect, drastic effect. In Kenya, a 13-year-old boy was shot dead because he was loitering around during a lockdown. In no. Nigeria, 18 people were killed uh, because uh, of all these things. So we, we are seeing a ripple effect. People are committing suicide because they're spending more time alone. Divorce cases have spiked in China alone because people are being forced to spend more time in those. We have developed a one size You have 30 seconds left. All right. So we have developed a one size fits all response to COVID 19 and have not looked at our own sectors. We have not looked at other sectors. We've not looked at 
uh, how it will affect Zambians here. I'm thinking about that Zambian who is, is feeding hand to mouth and what it would do to them if you cut their income and they cannot walk out there. So in conclusion, what I'm saying is COVID is not as crazy as you think it is because there are things such as the Black Plague that have killed 20 million people and none of these measures were put in place. It's only happening now because we've got social media, because it's affecting the Western world, and now it's, it's, it's hysterical. Everybody's going crazy because of what the West is telling us. Previously, your time is up, Freddy. All right. Unfortunately, your time is up. I'll invite the opposing right, team to give their argument. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me to take the lead and uh, my colleague Kasewa will add on. Uh, our rebuttals are as follows. Number one, uh, Freddie did mention- Apologies, that, Henry. Apologies, yeah. Henry. This sure. round is not for rebuttals. This round okay. is only for your main arguments. So ah, for now, okay. then you could write down takes your rebuttals. Over. Yeah, so it's right, right now if you could write down your rebuttals and we'll get to the round for rebuttals. For now, you no, have five to minutes to give your main argument. Apologies, sir. Kasewa will take over from me. Good evening. It has been said that when America sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. This time, however, it was China who sneezed. Now the whole world has gotten a cold. I stand here, or sit here rather, opposing to the motion, false alarm, the global response to COVID-19 is disproportional to its threat. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll pre present three main points, simple but profound points. My first point is COVID-19 is new and therefore there is a lot that we do not know about it. Every day we learn something new about COVID. Um, scientists would initially told us that COVID-19 is not airborne, but now some scientists believe it's airborne. Initially, we were advised to uh, wear masks, not to wear masks, and only medical personnel were advised to uh, wear masks, or people who have the virus to wear masks, but now we are being told that we have to uh, wear masks. Initially, we were told that COVID is only deadly to people who have underlying conditions or to, the, to, or to other people. But now, according to CNN, there was a, a report that doctors have discovered that persons between 30 and 40 have been getting sudden strokes as a result of COVID. Initially, we were taught that once you get COVID-19, you cannot get it again but now scientists are telling us you can get it again and again and again. I'll give an example. Dybala, uh, the player for Juventus, um, a club in Italy, has tested positive for COVID-19 for the fourth time in a space of, of six weeks. So the main point here is that we do not know about COVID and therefore we have to be Cautious. Every day we keep on learning something new. Scientists keep on disputing um, what they know. And therefore, we have to be very cautious because it might actually be worse than we uh, believe. Secondly, COVID-19 is contagious. It's highly contagious. In fact, it's more contagious than the flu. So again, this points to the fact that we have to, that the measures that we've taken are warranted. In a space of slightly over three months, uh, just from one case in China, now suddenly uh, we have over three million cases. Thirdly, COVID-19 is deadly. According to tupli.org, the death rate for COVID as of today stands at 7% meaning that of the people who've gotten COVID, 7% of people have died. Now that's a very large percentage, yes. But also, we COVID-19 came like a thief in the night. It, 
it surprised us. We were unprepared. And therefore, the measures we've taken are not disproportionate because they're giving us time. We're buying time. By coming up with all these measures, uh, such as lockdowns and closing borders, we are buying time to, to find a cure or a vaccine. As um, for SARS, it took two years to find a vaccine and that was early because the average time, according to um, the history of vaccines.org, the average time to discover a vaccine sometimes is 10 to 15 years. So therefore, um, we, the, we are not overreacting. As a matter of fact, we are underreacting and this can be seen by the, the, the blame game that world leaders have been playing. Um, the US Trump blames who saying they should have, have one minute won earlier and, and whatnot. So COVID-19, in conclusion, COVID-19 is deadly and COVID-19 is new. There's a lot that we don't know about it and it's very contagious. Therefore, our reactions are not unwarranted and we actually need to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Kasewe, for that. I'll now call upon Mwansambewe. COVID-19 is infectious. We should worry about it. It may kill us. Mwansambewe. Thank you very much, Koza. The issue at hand is a proportional response. This means that the response is equivalent to the threat. By way of analogy, killing a single fly with a fly swatter or insecticide is a proportional response because of the effort and the damage done is equivalent to the threat of the fly. On the contrary, hiring an exterminator is not a proportional response because the effort put in compared to the expected outcome are not in proportion. In order to argue my case, I am going to lean on two facts. The first one is that the statistics about COVID-19 are inaccurate at best and intentionally misleading at worst. My second point will be that the non-medical effects of the lockdowns implementation by the majority of world governments around the world are catastrophic. To begin, the statistics about COVID-19 are inaccurate at best and intentionally misleading at worst. The global testing for COVID-19 currently makes no differentiation between dying from COVID as opposed to dying with COVID. A local example is one of the three deaths in Zambia was a suicide, but to date, it is still counted as a death from COVID-19. In New York, one of the hotspots of COVID-19 pandemic, with just over 40% of the cases in the United States, a third, one third, that is one out of every three of the fatalities were not even tested for COVID. They are counted as COVID deaths, but they were not tested for COVID. Rather, they are said to have succumbed to COVID-19 or an equivalent. Something that has to be emphasized is the fact that the infection rate for this disease and a multitude of others is much higher than the positive tests. For example, and to put this into perspective, the, the influenza. The CDC in the United States states that just under 250,000 people tested positive for the flu this past winter and 24,000 died. This makes the case fatality rate of the flu to be 10%. However, anybody listening to this and anybody with half a brain knows that one out of every, that it isn't, that it isn't the case one out of every 10 people with the flu dies because case fatality rate is not something that we count. Instead, we count infection fatality rates. And it is estimated by the very same CDC that during that same season, the case, the number of cases of the, of the flu in the United States was 39 million people. If you look at 39 million people who had the flu and the death rate of 24,000 people, it reduces the infection fatality rate to below 0.1%. I repeat, below 0.1%. We cannot use case fatality rates because infection fatality rates are what counts. And at the moment, we do not know how many people are infected of COVID-19. Um, the very fact that 
the, the, a majority of people who test positive for coronavirus for COVID-19 are asymptomatic, meaning they show no symptoms of having the disease, supports the notion that the infection rate is way higher than we are able to test, but also that the, the fatality rate and disruption to one's life is also way lower than the numbers indicated. Researchers at the Columbia University in Manhattan tested every woman who came in for labor between March 22nd and April 14th. 15% of these people tested positive for COVID-19. However, 88% of those 15% were totally asymptomatic. They had no idea they had it. Keep in mind, these women came into the hospital for labor, not because they thought they had COVID-19. And yet, every single one of that 15% had COVID-19 and recovered without being aware. Many people are actually claiming that the large number one of people with the disease, the large number of people minute. asymptomatic shows that the, pro the prolongation of the shutdown does not work. Another point that you have to factor in is that there is no pattern that shows that having locked down your town or your city shows a decreased infection rate. If you look at the statistics, cities with lockdown and cities without lockdown are not showing that the lockdown is exactly working. My last point is the effects of the lockdown implemented by the world government. Abuses, domestic abuse and substance abuse has been at an all time high. In China, it is up 18% in just a matter of weeks. In France, it is up 30% and in Spain, it is up 20%. And we all know that two things that increase domestic abuse, joblessness, and alcohol abuse, both of which are at an all-time high because of the implementation of the policies by the government. So in closing, the statistics that are being used for the policies are inaccurate at best and intentionally, intentionally misleading at worst. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Mwansa. Henry, statistical error? Hello? Hello Henry, are you there? Yes, I can get you. I'm here. Okay, Henry, it's your turn to speak. I'm saying, is it is the information that we're receiving just statistical error? Well, I will seek to address all, the, all those and similar concerns in my argument now. Allow me to uh, begin. And uh, for those who have just joined us, we are the opposing team. And we are faced with an uncommon challenge. Our societies were never prepared for this massive onslaught we're witnessing. History is being written right now. And which side do you want to be, passive or active, indifferent or determined not to face the problem which is at hand? Always assume that your opponent is going to be bigger and stronger, faster than you, so that you learn to rely on technique, timing and leverage rather than brute strength, is a quote from Helio Gracia, a martial arts guru. And it's from that background that we draw our argument. You see, we have been here before. We are here before when the HIV AIDS pandemic struck. And as we said in our opening remarks, Tabo Mbeki is quoted to say that HIV AIDS was a mere phantom and that it was just a ghost. It was a force making by uh, companies to make money and viral companies to make money from poor populations. And Tabo Mbeki says that this HIV AIDS was killing those who are poor and those who are coming from already compromised backgrounds. 20 years later, 30 years later, we are the generation seeing that even those who are wealthy, those who were of good health, sound mind, died during that pandemic. How many of our relatives, you know, rich and in good condition have died because of that pandemic? And in our generation, we've seen a new pandemic, which is coronavirus. There have been many other uh, pandemics that have struck the world. 5,000 years ago, there was a pandemic in China, in fact, an epidemic. There was also another pandemic called Black Death, which Freddie made reference to. And we see that if the pandemic is left to run its course, it will, have, it will have great havoc uh, in communities. For instance, let me give you an example of this. There have been arguments of uh, Guinness common flu and coronavirus and linking them together. Coronavirus, according to CDC, 
affects up to 80%, and as a death rate, as Chisewa Kasewa said, of now 7%, which is very high, you see? Currently, we've had 3 million people who've uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus, 1 million have recovered, but we have 234,000 deaths and still counting. In opposition to the common flu, common flu only affects 8% of America's total population and the death rate is at 0.1%. These are statistics coming from the Center for Disease Control. And who's been affected the most is the question. According to John Hopkins Hospital, according to the 25th of, uh, of April, three quarters of those infected and died are African Americans, being in low income brackets, with little access to health facilities and having underlying conditions. The chances, the chances of survival is really low, but if they access a ventilator, they're good. Coming back closer home, just here in Zimbabwe, there was a young man named Zororo Makamba. He died in an isolation ward less than three days after testing positive. He died because the country was not ready to admit him. How could they handle a case so new with threats so real, having no medical uh, things to use, you know? And coming back to Zambia, we have a population of 17 million people with only 20 functioning units of ventilators. It therefore means that should this disease, should this virus wreak havoc over our country, would be just a song to sing of that there once was a country called Zambia. A failure to prepare and prevent this infection and a person-to-person -person infection would be a disaster for a nation like Zambia with already compromised health sector. Just in the United States, they have claimed and they've said that we are failing with our health systems. And this is a country that is a great donor to Zambians health, health facilities. Henry, you have one minute left. Thank you very much. If America is struggling with their best doctors and best health infrastructure, how can we surely survive? What has been the response? Suspension of all international flights, sporting activities canceled, churches closed, higher hygiene standards to be mentioned, to be maintained. Are we saying all oh, this is too much? so that we can save that three month old baby to be who tested positive. Our team wants to agree that all this is proportionate to the threat that we have. And lastly, we cannot believe China to give us statistics because China has got a fascist government system. China compromises information. Yeah, China even killed time is up. Time is many up. people who are whistleblowers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. Now, at this time, each team will be given exactly three minutes to rebuttal each team's points or their main point of argument. We'll start with the opposers, and then the um, proposers will give their rebuttals. But before they begin, I'd like to remind each one of us that at the bottom of the screen, there's an option, which is more in the chat room. If you, in case you want to ask any question, you can post your questions in the chat room, and we'll ask them in the Q&A later. Um, Monsambewe or Freddy, any rebuttals? Okay, um, first rebuttal. Because so we talked about how we're learning more of this disease, so therefore we should uh, be apprehensive about it. We're learning more of it, but that does not we, that does not mean we don't know of it. How how it's acting, how it's killing the number of people it's killing. Uh, we've already looked at. I, I shared with you statistics of people that are getting infected. Ninety percent of people that get COVID, or out of them, ninety percent are getting healed. And we, we, we were told it's 7% of the people that are dying. Um, in Zambia, three out of uh, 95 people have died. Do your math, that's 2.8% of people. So that is wrong math. If we bring it down here, they're saying no, COVID is going to wreak havoc and kill all of us. China is reporting now cases of one in 87 people having COVID almost every day, meaning it's dying down. What's What's killing COVID or what's making COVID to die down is not because of the measures that have been put in place. It's because of our immune system. The more we get exposed to, to diseases and viruses, the more our immune system gets stronger. Monta already talked about women that went to deliver and were found to have had contracted COVID at a particular time. Uh, Pablo Dybala contracting COVID 
repeat over and over again is one person who is unverified and we have not uh, been, been, it's not been verified information. Then the other thing is, uh, Henry talks about the common flu in disproportionate to COVID. Not everyone has a common flu, not everyone has coronavirus. So we cannot then talk about uh, COVID as if everybody had it. And lastly, I want to talk about uh, there being a difference between having adequate medical uh, response to the crisis and the measures that we are having in place. A lockdown uh, and et cetera, et cetera, closing borders, no flights, is not the same thing as not having a ventilator at a hospital. Professor, you hospital. have exactly one minute left. Okay, let me leave that one minute to Mwansa. Let him uh, also uh, rebut. Our opponents have said that our society and hospitals were not prepared for this virus. This is categorically inaccurate, as can be shown by hospitals worldwide laying off staff and added to the fact that 95% of hospitals worldwide are not overloaded. In fact, you will know that the majority of them are actually empty. These new hospitals that have been built, a number of them are majority empty. This includes countries that are locked down and countries that are not. The vast majority of ventilators that were being cried for a month ago are sitting unused as we speak. The vast majority. To, to, to make this point clear, when was the last time you heard anyone asking about ventilators? Even in Zambia, when was the last time? None. I repeat, the issue at hand is a proportional response. The hit on the economy, the joblessness caused, the deaths from diseases because of hospitals and clinics being closed outside of COVID-related matters far surpasses the deaths from COVID, which I have proven are inaccurate because of the lack of differentiation between deaths from COVID Proposers, and deaths with time COVID. Is up. Those are two different things. Your time is up. I Proposers, Henry? Yes, Henry thanks, Kwasa. Yeah, number one, our rebuttal is, number one, we can't trust China. China hid this information from us from day one. Whistleblower came out and said there's a crisis here. The government shelved that until it was out of hand. We can't trust China statistics. Number two, the pandemic is evolving. It's a new thing, okay? And the pandemic has not run its course. Coronavirus hasn't finished. So it's unfair for us to get the Italian flu, to get the black fever, black death, and compare it to coronavirus, which has not yet been done. Let's compare it after two years when coronavirus is done. Number three, once I talked about dying from COVID or with COVID and people being that they succumb to this, it's been clear. CDC has mentioned on a number of occasions that these people who died had underlying conditions. And the three quarters who died in America, yes, African Americans had underlying conditions. But the fact of the matter, it's true. They had respiratory problems and because of the virus. Uh, number four, before I hand over to Kasewa, is these issues of lockdown. North Korea did a lockdown faster than anyone else, and North Korea is the model. They only had 230 deaths. They have a population of 25 million people. Imagine if these people did not respond appropriately. China, the next neighbor, has had more deaths. In fact, Freddie is saying we should rely on China statistics. Guess what? China, as of last week, said we were sorry we underreported the number of deaths. In fact, 50% more people died. So can we really believe China? It's at our own peril if we don't take this thing serious. Posterity will judge us. Over to Kasewe. Once I said, um, there's no proof that there's a shortage of ventilators and um, world leaders are, are crying out for ventilators. The mayor of New York has been crying, uh, asking, the, asking Trump and his government to, to give and send over our ventilators. Once I mentioned saying that uh, some hospitals are empty, even the newly constructed hospitals are empty, maybe that's because people are dying and people have died as evidenced by the mass graves that we have been seeing uh, in Italy and in Brazil. We are seeing trucks full of human beings and these people ha haven't even been given a, a funeral and whatnot. So COVID is deadly. And the numbers might actually be much, much worse, especially for China. 
that's what our official report Kim, you have 30 seconds left. To conclude, things do not just happen. Okay, look at the numbers that we have here. Things don't just happen. It's not because of good immunity system. It's because health systems must be enforced so that people live well. The reason why more poor people have got higher death rate compared to rich people is because they don't have good health facilities. And therefore, if we leave this virus, it will wreak havoc on the whole globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you for sharing your screen, by the way. Um, I would like to advise our audience members if you would like to give a question, you can put it in your options. When you click your screen, there's a more option there, the chat button, you can put your question there. Or you can wait till the Q&A when I'll ask you to raise your hand and you can ask your question when I call out your name. Um, for now, we're going to our cross-examination um, teams. I will allow the proposers to begin. Actually, I'll allow the opposers to begin. You have seven minutes for cross-examination uh, to cross-examine the argument of each team. Could you clarify who's cross-examining who? You. The proposer, sorry. I think I mentioned that. I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, my first, my first uh, question to the opposers is they, they, they seem to be conflating my argument in order to not answer my question. I did not say that, all, that some hospitals do not need ventilators. I said the vast majority of hospitals are not using the ventilators. So my question is, outside of New York, outside of Italy, and outside of Spain, do you know of any other nation that is crying out about the need for ventilators? If you knock out the hotspots, which other nations are crying out for ventilators? Once we cannot uh, knock out the hotspots because the pandemic, as it evolves, has got an incubation period of 14 days, which has since evolved to 21 days. Initially, we had China, and China was crying out for help and building more hospitals. The hotspots are ever changing. Guess what? The hotspot is now in South Africa, and the South Africa has got the highest numbers of people who are dying. Currently, you have over 103 people who have died to death. It therefore means that in the next week or two, these guys will be asking for ventilators, they'll be asking for PEPs, they'll be asking for help. In fact, do you know that Cuban doctors have since flown into South Africa to help them address this challenge? I do know about the Cuban doctors, but once again, you are conflating the argument. A, 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 a global pandemic, a global pandemic means that it is wreaking havoc globally. Not all At countries the same are time, locked down, not all cities are not all countries are locked down and not all cities are locked down. And there is no pattern, no pattern that locking down has increased or decreased the number of deaths. So we've shown you, we've shown you, fact, I'll, North I'll, Korea. I'll, 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 actually, I'll actually switch, hold on, I'll actually switch the question. You've just said that the gestation time or average hospital stay of people with COVID-19 is 14 days. Kasewe says that the reason why the hospitals are not filled up is because the people are dying very fast. You know that's inaccurate because you have just said that the average stay in hospital is 14 days and yet the vast majority of hospitals are empty. The new hospitals that are being built are empty. True or false? Can you give us a name of a hospital? UTH is not, is not filled up. Levy Junction is not, Zambia. Is not filled up. Even in South even in South Africa, which you are calling a hot spot, the vast majority of the hospitals being prepared there are not filled to capacity. They are not overloaded. Hospitals are laying off staff. True or false? Please come again. True or false? True or false? Hospitals are laying off staff. They are sending. No, staff that's false. That's false. As, as of as of yesterday, the health minister did say to Chilufia Chitalu that they've recruited about 102 medical personnel needing to enforce the already existing workforce. So that's already forced right here in Zambia. 
you need to you need to keep yes, in mind that we're talking about the global response. We're not yes, even on the Zambia, global scene, one sir. <laughs> on the global scene, guess what? As what has happened in U, in the UK, in Italy, in America, they've called out for those who had retired to come back into the workforce and help the situation. Isn't that a crisis at hand? Once again. Once again, and you are conflating the argument because they are talking about hotspots when I'm talking about the global response. Can we keep the global response in mind? Kasewa, you can check it the out. The hotspots are part of the, the globe. Are part of the globe. So we can't uh, not discuss them. We, we actually have to learn okay. from them. In USA, okay, okay. Uh, doctors... Okay, fine. Is fine to to, to, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Hold on, just... To, just to prove my point, and this will be my last rebuttal, if you calculate the hotspots as a percentage of the global pandemic, you still remain with them as a minority. The hotspots are much fewer than cities in the world or countries in the world that are affected by the pandemic. So once again, we're talking about a global pandemic. You, can, you, cannot only pick, you can't pick and choose your cases. We're talking about the global yeah, also pandemic. Also picking and choosing. The, the, All right. Uh, thank you, Monta. Henry, you stated that the lockdown, locking down our cities is what will save us. I didn't right. say it's what will save us, I say it has helped already North Korea, yes. North Korea? No, 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 I, I, I took, I wrote down what you, what you were saying verbatim, you said the lockdown is what will save us, locking down cities is what's going to save us. One of the measures, one of the measures. Okay, so now, that's, that's, that's one of the... The, the responses that we're saying is disproportionate. Now, I want you to answer me this. When we lock down a city or a nation like Zambia, and we have people that are hand to mouth every day, they depend on selling something and things like that, and therefore we have starvation already uh, in place. So these people cannot work, so therefore they cannot eat. Uh, starvation is already happening in India. We have uh, a lockdown leading to unemployment. People are being laid off because you cannot work. So there's only, not only starvation, there are people that are unemployed, uh, which is leading to a high crime rate because people need to find food or money. Um, in, in response to COVID, in response, especially let's take it to Zambia, in response to the 95 cases, and those people that will starve will be without a job and spike crime rate. Do you think locking down is still the white thing to do. Okay, I think I've gotten Freddie's question. You're kind of breaking there. Freddie, did you know that Zambia's population, most of the population, about 70 to 80 percent, are in the formal sector and they're into the agricultural sector? And do you know where those live? In your village. Do you know what they're doing? They're farming. Do you know they've got no formal job? Are they dying of hunger currently? No. no, no, no. What's Henry, a... Henry, Henry, the question... No, no, no. I'm answering your answer. question. Let me I'm finish. talking about a person in a white collar job, a person who, yes. who reports for work. Henry, sorry, let me, let me, let me okay. rephrase the question. So here's sure. a guy. Fred, here's mm -hmm. a guy named Freddy. He is okay. in employment and mm -hmm. he cannot work anymore because of the lockdown. His employer cannot generate money to pay him, so therefore he's laid off. He has rent to pay mm. because he does not have an income. He cannot rent stay in that house. His landlord is not as generous as other people will say, will not, you will not pay rent. So therefore, his landlord is saying, pay me. Or he's saying, okay, you can stay in the house for free, but at the end of COVID, you need to pay me. So therefore, he's inquiring debt. After that, he does not have money to go out and start mass shopping to stock up because he is not like these other people. He's not saved. His job is hand to mouth. There are 10,000 Freddies. 5,000 Freddies decide they will start stealing, okay, for them to earn an income. So therefore, there's a spike in crime rate. I get Those you, I get you. 2,000 Freddies cannot deal with what has happened and not feeding for their families, therefore they get depressed and kill themselves. There's a spike. I get you. The other 2,000 Freddies have got underlining medical conditions because of stress and depression enter into under, their underlining illnesses pop up and they die, okay? Three, 1,000 Freddies have got other conditions, okay? They need to go to the hospital, but when they go to the hospital, they are told your condition is not as... Okay, Freddie, I get you, I get you. With COVID people. Those we Freddies have one minute. Die.
So when you consider locking down, is it proportionate Wait, to what give us time. the after effect? We get you, Freddie. We get you. We give get us you. time. To give any time to respond. Yes. Okay. Let me respond to you. In our opening remarks, we did say that these are the responses government has put in place. One you've pointed out is the lockdown. Now, when the lockdown is effected, it's what it's called kind of a partial lockdown. And even if there was a total lockdown, essential workers are allowed to work. Let me tell you something. Most of the people you're referring to as leaving hands to mouth. Guess what? They fall in the bracket of essential workers. And these people still manage to get their supplies in and get in their food. And let's give an example of India, the worst case scenario, where people are sent back to rural areas because there's no jobs for them, though they are essential. Guess what? The government is providing for them the basics that they need, the food that they need. Just here in South Africa, they've been given milli meal, they've been given uh, cooking oil, the basics to get by week by week. Henry, this lockdown, the lockdown is not Henry, for forever, was, Freddy. It's for two weeks. In southern province, mm. and our government didn't do anything. All of a sudden, we, we did doing things because of Corona. We did, Freddy. Where's the money coming from? Your time is up, proposers. Um, I'll have to give the floor to the opposers now now for cross-examination. Henry? Kassiwa, would you like to start with on? your question? Yes, let me start. Um, Just start. give me a moment, Kassiwa. There's a participant with their mic on. Team, participants, if you could, actually the audience members, if you could turn off your mics as you join the conversation. Um, Kassiwa, please go ahead. Um, my first, I've got a question for Mwansa, and I also have a question for uh, Freddy. So, Mwansa, you mentioned that um, worker, medical personnel are being laid off around the world, but yet that's not in line with the evidence. In Italy, final year students were admitted as doctors because of the shortage of medical personnel, one. Two, in New York and in Europe, there are reports that um, some medical personnel have committed would, suicide. Would you like a response to your question? They are, because they are under immense pressure and they're working overtime and they're understaffed. Just recently, a, a senior doctor in New York committed suicide. Then, um, would you like a response to your question? Um, let me ask Freddie then. Oh, then you guys can respond. And then, Freddie, you mentioned that COVID-19 is not as bad as other uh, plagues that have occurred in the past. And yet, one, COVID-19 is ongoing, so we, we don't know how bad things will get. Secondly, I'll give an example of SARS. SARS lasted about eight months only, it only killed 800 people in such a long period, and it only infected 8,000 people. So your statement in your main argument um, that COVID is not as bad as other plagues is incorrect, especially in light of the fact that COVID is still ongoing and we're, we're in its initial stages as we speak. Yeah, thank you. In response to your question, you're using what is called anecdotal evidence. Evidence. I'll use an analogy and I'll give the answer to your question. If I say that there is a global decline in the in the in the demand for heaters, you cannot you come to me globally, and say in Alaska, workers are being laid off. Relax, re relax. Hold on. Listen to the answer. Listen to the answer. Anecdotal evidence is you say when I respond by when I tell you that there is a decline in the global demand for heaters, you cannot then respond by saying in Alaska where the, the temperatures are in the negatives right now, do they not require heaters? Yes, they do, because the temperature is in the negatives. That does not negate the fact that there is a global decline in heaters. Bringing it to the direct answer that I was giving, hospitals worldwide are laying off staff. Do your, just, just, just Google, just Google. It, 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 they are laying off because staff left, right, and center because it's hold on, hold on, listen, just, just listen. Some authorities. The reason, no, no, hold on, the, hold on, hold on. The reason why they are laying off staff globally is because clinics are closed. All things outside of COVID treatment are being closed down. 
in New York, the same place that you like referring to, 75% of operating rooms are closed. What are those people doing right now? They're actually not helping out with the COVID. They are being laid off, a number of those people. They, and the, the cancer wards, a number of them are being closed down and people are being laid off. So globally, medical staff are being laid off. In the hotspots, they are requiring more people, but globally, they are being laid off. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Freddy, sorry to chip in. And, sorry to chip in. Sorry to no, chip in. No, I need in. to answer. Kasura. Can I answer Kasura's question before you chip in okay. so that I don't lose yes. my line sure. of thought? Okay. So, Kasura, the motion here is: is the response disproportionate to the threat or proportionate to the threat? So, what I'm saying is: look, in the past, yes, COVID is progressing, but in the past, we've had plagues that have killed more. Okay. At the height of those plagues is a black plague with 20 million people dead okay we've had those things happening and nobody has reacted the way they're reacting now in america uh for example i will give you statistics of a heart disease killed 647 457 people is heart disease cancer, contagious cancer listen listen to what is i'm saying heart disease Listen, let me finish the argument, Kasewe. Then you, cancer has killed 599,000. Accidents mm -hmm. have killed 169,000. Now, what has been the response? Okay, let's look at accidents. What has been the response to people who died? Okay, Fred, do we get you? We get you. 7,173 people have died. Fred, do so we get you? The argument here is not that COVID is, 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 is done. I'm, I'm answering the question. Let me finish answering the question. The argument but we is get not your that point. COVID is not having some effect. We're saying, we're saying in relation to other plagues and other common day diseases, COVID is child's play. And the response to these other things is not as much as we are with COVID. The main issue here, people are saying, no, the main, the main daddy. issue, Kasewe, 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 the main issue with COVID is death. We wouldn't be having all these measures if we were not afraid to die. But our argument is people have died from far much worse and we have not responded in like manner. The only reason why we're responding like this, part of it is because of the media frenzy that's around it. But okay, Freddy, Freddy, you're like eating into our time. Realize, We've got your point. Fact. Number one, uh, Freddy, you did mention about issues of immunity system. And you said that people are recovering because of their immunity system. Are you trying to suggest, Freddie, that uh, white people have got a better immunity system than us Africans? Then Mwansa no. and Freddie, no, wait, 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 let me finish, let me finish. Then Mwansa and Freddie, uh, I'm afraid that uh, your team has failed to understand the word pandemic. You say pandemic, the coronavirus is a pandemic, you agree to it, but you refuse to go all, the whole way with it. By definition, a pandemic is a disease is something which is contagious, which wrecks havoc across the whole globe. So on one hand, you are saying, yes, coronavirus is only just in hotspots and we can't use those hotspots. Then in the other breath, you're saying something else. You are. So there's a pandemic. Then to end, you see, there is a curve. And the curve is progressing. New York has gone past that curve. It's now flattened. South Africa is heading towards that curve. China went past that cave. Italy went past that cave. Zambia is yet to get to that cave later on. It's a progressing thing. Can't compare to is black death. Question? Black death is, is dying. Are you, are you Coronavirus you is here. Question? Sorry? Are you giving a question or are you debating? Are you, are you, are you, are you using this time? I'm cross-examining. I'm cross-examining your... When you cross I'm cross-examining your question. Okay, team. Unfortunately, your time is up. So thank yeah, so, you so much for the cross-examination from each of you. Uh, we'll now open it up to the audience sorry, to give their question. Sorry, if Mr. you can give me a moment. Freddie, yeah. Freddie, thank you. Give me a moment. I would like to open yes, up sir. to the audience to ask their questions. So if you have a question, kindly raise your hand. We do have some questions already that are in the chat room. Um, Freddie, you wanted to say something? You can go ahead. I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay. What I wanted to say is they, they, in their rebuttal, 
they were sneaking in points that they didn't have time to sneak in. So that wasn't a much of a cross-examination, okay? And what are, in, in, in response, when you cross-examine someone, they must respond. That's why it's called cross-examination. You're punching holes into their argument. So if we have no time to respond, then it's a bit unfair. So I was wondering if uh, you could indulge us with a minute, 30 seconds to me, 30 seconds to Mwanza, to respond to what they brought across. Okay, um, if I indulge that, then I'll also have to give the opposing team, again, another 30 seconds and another 30 seconds to respond to some of the things that you brought out earlier. Um, due to time, I'll ask that you have 30 seconds to respond and I'll give the team as well 30 seconds to respond to some of the items that you brought out earlier. So 30 seconds start now. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to say was, we are not ignoring that this is a pandemic. We're saying other things, that there have been other pandemics as well. For example, the Ebola virus was a pandemic, but because it was affecting blacks, black people, people did not panic. It was in America here, a bit, people did not panic as much. I, I, I keep on talking about cholera. I don't know if it's cholera or cholera. I, I, I mix up the two. It killed more people in Zambia than, than the corona right now. And no one was panicking. When the corona first hit in, in Zambia, you saw tweets everywhere. One month from now, Italy started like this. It was wild. It's not the case here. Someone will argue, no, because we're not testing. We're not, but we're not seeing people dying in numbers, okay? This thing is different from demographic to demographic, and it's how it's affecting. The way it's affecting SA is not the way it's affecting us. So we cannot pick a one-size-fits-all uh, approach because it, the U.S. is doing it. We, we, we take it here because that is not what's going to help. We're not, we should think for ourselves and think what will work for Zambians. Already, Zambia is not under lockdown per se. We're going up on, on, on about our business, but the, the disease is not spread as much as was predicted. So therefore, their Ready, argument... Your time is turn, up. Okay, thank you. Your time is up. I'd like to correct Freddy. If you have anything to say, please go ahead. Of course, we do. Second. I'd like to correct Freddy. Ebola was not a pandemic. It's not a pandemic. It's an epidemic. Okay, it's restricted. A pandemic has got a passport and highly contagious. We've said in our opening statement, 80%, between 50 and 80% of people in America are getting infected with coronavirus compared to common flu, only 8%. Ebola is no comparison. If a coronavirus is yet to run its full course. We're only in the first three months, four months of this disease. The black fever, ran its whole course for the whole year for, for maybe even three years, okay? We are yet to see the stats, the full stats for coronavirus. And allow me to re-emphasize on behalf of our team. If we let this go by, we'll have to answer to our posterity because we do not take this thing serious. Henry, Never underrate an enemy. Up. Henry, your time is up. Um, thank you so much. Kuzwayo Tembo will now take over reading the questions. I'll read one question that I found quite interesting that I received. Was we look at coronavirus and we look at the measures that have been done in the West and the statistics that are largely mentioned are mostly Western statistics. Do we have any reference, that is to the opposing team, any reference to African statistics and how it will impact the African economy? Proposals, Henry. All right. Sorry, cause I mi I missed that. We received one interesting question that I received in my inbox was the impact that was talking about statistics for the coronavirus, and largely were referring to Western statistics and how how it's impacted the West. But out of those statistics, do we have any information on how it impacts Africa? And yes, we do. Uh, I shared my screen and I showed the stats from the African perspective and how that uh, Africa is now growing, South Africa particularly, to be the epicenter. So we're yet to get our facts right as the African continent. You know, we're grappling with a number of things. But we have our stats, the African Union is working hard and the World Health Organization, the chapter for Africa. And I could share the stats again here if you like, but uh, I think there's no need. Wow. 
Kuzwa your temple. Hello. All right. So there were a number of questions uh, that have been posted in the chat room. Uh, but first, I think uh, we, earlier on we had Pumulo raise her hand okay. and then Esnat Matimba. So I'm just going to ask them to prepare, to ask their questions. But while they're preparing, um, I'm going to read uh, two questions. Uh, so the first one is to the proposing team from Zeli Papiri. Uh, so the question is, what do you think would necessitate a lockdown? Aren't three deaths uh, enough? So that question is to the proposing team. Uh, and then a question from Evans Mulenga to the opposing team. Uh, the question if, is, if most people are recovering from the virus, then why should we stress? Uh, if most people are recovering from the virus, then why should we stress? Then I'm going to ask Pumulo, uh, if you're ready, please unmute your mic and ask your question. And then after that, Esnat Matimba uh, to ask uh, her question. A quick response to the uh, aren't three deaths enough? The, the the mini lockdown that has happened in in Zambia, mini lockdown. It's not a part. It's not a full lockdown. It's just a partial lockdown. The mini lockdown that has happened in Zambia, with schools closing, has meant that a number of schools have been unable to pay teachers their salaries for this month, for this past month. Rent has to be paid. Food has to be bought. A number of bills have to be paid, and not everybody has savings. And so I don't think the people who do not have money coming into this month are going to agree with you that three deaths necessitates a lockdown, which has caused them to lose their income. And they say, that's just teachers. I haven't gone into any of the other sectors that have been affected from just And I feel I'll live longer <laughs> because I have things like um, Okay. In... In addition to what Monsa was saying, aren't three deaths enough to necessitate a lockdown? Yeah, the answer is no. Okay, can I pause until the person mutes the mic? Okay, yeah. So it's, it's not proportional looking at the effects of the lockdown, especially like I was saying earlier, uh, what we have here in Zambia, in Africa. Let's take, for example, Kafiwa, where we had something uh, reminiscent of a lockdown. I have a relative there who was telling me how hard it was for the few days that they were on lockdown because he is a trader. He's hand to mouth. He couldn't feed his family, go out and do whatever because the, the soldiers were on the street. Okay, So therefore, slowly they were starving and therefore he was asking for aid. We see this also in India where lockdown has been implemented. Uh, Google, you will see thousands of people on the street uh, standing in uh, social distance lines asking for food uh, because uh, they've been in, in, in lockdown. And where that has not happened, there's, there's, a, there's a danger for civil unrest. There's a danger for, for crime to spike because people do not have what to do. So three cases is not enough uh, for us to implement a lockdown, especially for an economy such as ours. Maybe the only reason we've had three deaths is because of the measures that we've put in place. So maybe it's because the government is doing a great job and has responded proportionately to the virus. Maybe if we had done nothing, we would have had way more deaths than those three. That's my brief um, response. All right, uh, so please respond to the question that has been asked to the opposing team, uh, either Kasewe or Henry. If most people are recovering from the virus, then why are we stressing? I think as well as partly answered it, we need to stress. Uh, if we don't stress, it therefore means that we can have a bigger onslaught. You see, when you're about to write an exam and you realize your exam is the following day and you haven't studied the whole semester, you've got two options on your table. Number one, sleep and go into the exam room tomorrow and fail. Number two, stress and stud. Study all the way to seven hours and go into the exam room and ace that exam. So we need to stress, yes, the number of people who are, who are dying are very few, and that may be as a result of the measures we've instituted. Maybe the Ministry of Health of Zambia is doing a great job by closing down the churches and uh, closing down the bars and restaurants. If they were open, would have seen a major onslaught, like in other countries. Trump, President Donald Trump, for a long time, as far back as February, 
when the first case was reported in China, downplayed this whole thing. And he said, guys, let's not stress. You know what? In a week or two, the numbers will go to zero. It will go away. But right. America has got the highest numbers than any other place. So we are better off stressing than not stressing at all. And very right. quickly, uh, thank you. Second. Second. Sorry, second. I will have to cut you off. I will have Could to cut you off second. for the sake of time. Uh, sorry, seconds. Kasewe. Sorry, Kasewe. I will have to cut you off. There are quite a lot of questions. Uh, there's another question. Uh, I'll be reading one question for the opposing and then one question for the proposing side. So I'll start with the proposing side. A question from Chi to Mwansa. Uh, please elaborate on the aspect of infection case rate versus case rate. Uh, Mwasa, please elaborate on the aspect of infection versus, versus uh, case statistics. And then the question for the uh, opposing side, uh, a question was raised by Kalumba, uh, and that is, North Korea has been cited to have better communication than China. Please clarify. A quick response to the issue of infection case effect, infection fatality rates against case fatality rates. So using the example I gave once again, in the USA, the CDC gave a number of cases that they found of the season of flu at just under 250,000. Of those cases, 24,000 died of those cases that they found. However, it is estimated because not everybody who has the flu goes into hospital. There's a number, so they, they, they extrapolate. And, and with the extrapolation, it is extrapolated that 39 million people had the season of flu. So infection case fatality rate is 24,000 of just under 250,000. That sounds like 10%. But infection fatality rate is the number of people infected compared to the number of people who have died. And so for that one, it is found that the season of flu kills less than 0.1%. And as I said in, in, in my opening statement, this, the, the, the statistics that we have about COVID-19 deaths are inaccurate because a suicide is counted as a COVID death. 40% of the people in New York were not even tested and yet they are counted as COVID deaths. It's inaccurate. So. We are, we are afraid of a death rate that is inaccurate. We, give us clear statistics and then we can make sense of it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, a quick response to the other question uh, from the opposing Okay, team. yeah, some clear statistics will be given as I answer the question from one of the people in the audience. Uh, people find it hard to believe, even I did, that North Korea is doing so much better than any other country in the world because they enforced a lockdown earlier on, okay? And they had all these issues of wearing masks, wearing masks and other health preventative measures. And currently, currently, North Korea has only about 203 people who've died out of a population of 25 million people in that country. And that country is small, number one. Number two, it's very close to the, all the hotspots that we know. And it's amazing that if we can enforce things like lockdowns, restrict international travel. Can you imagine that about 80% of all the cases we have in Zambia currently as a result of people who had flown out or have flown in into Zambia, Pakistan, the couple that went to France, it's crazy. And so if we can effect these lockdowns, uh, would be good. All right, uh, thank you. At this point, I'm going to ask uh, Pumulo to speak. And then I'm going to ask Himish Po. Himish Po. Uh, so Pumulo and then. So the proposing team kept stating that the infection rate is not reducing when the country goes into lockdown. I would like to ask for any proof because um, on the contrary, uh, a country that implemented the lockdown well, India, half after the lockdown. So does the proposing team have any example of a country where the lockdown is not a thing? Well, that's a good right. question. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, yes, before actually. you respond. Sorry, no. before you respond. Sorry. I'd like us to hear the question from Pumulo. Uh, it seems she's not present because I think I've been asking for her for, for a bit. Uh, Mantel Masumba, please go ahead and mute your mic and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, please. Yes. Uh, is that Pomolo? Yes, yes. You are very audible. But I, I, I just wanted to find out where both parties are getting their statistics from about the numbers concerning COVID. All right, thank you. Uh, where are you getting your statistics from? Uh, and then uh, lastly, for this set of questions, Mantel Masumba, please unmute your mic and ask your question. Okay, so um, uh, um, I have a question for Henry. The current uh, pandemic uh, is uh, putting uh, some stress on our political system, leading in some cases to expansion of executive powers. What development concerns you and, and what can Zambians do to safeguard our democracy, our democratic mm -hmm. traditions, norms, institutions, and voting rights? Because concerning the fact that um, come next year, we might we'll be having elections. So mm -hmm. is Zambia prepared in the event that uh, this pandemic um, stays with us to next year in that regard? Is Zambia prepared? Yeah. All right, uh, so we we'll have uh, those questions answered in that order. The first question about where in the world are these measures being put in place and yet there's no response. Sorry, there's no correlated improvement in the, in the number of cases. Uh, and then where are the statistics uh, being taken from uh, for both teams? Uh, where are you getting your statistics on the numbers? And then thirdly, um, what is the effect of this virus uh, on our, our democracy and our political uh, status as a country and how we're preparing uh, for any effects that will arise. So please answer those questions. Okay, so uh, the first uh, one about wait. statistics. Where is the, first, the, the first one about the Ready. statistics, CDC. Ready. The, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, so Ready. concerning the statistics, CDC stats, uh, have been yeah. the CDC, the things about the, the abuse rate in China, um, that one is, it's, 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 it's readily, that's from, the, that's from the police in China, uh, the police in Spain, and the police in France. Those are, those are widely available information. Everything I've said is pretty much either CDC or official sources, like the police. Um, yeah. Uh, then, Concerning the, um, what, what, what was, th th there is no pattern that can be seen that shows that a lockdown reduces the number of cases. So for example, New York, where the cases keep rising, is in full lockdown, and yet the cases still rise. Sweden, which is not in lockdown, has cases that the death rate is going up because people, are, people do keep dying, but not at the same rate as those that are in lockdown. Uh, Michigan in the USA is not, no, Michigan is in lockdown. There's another state, sorry, I don't have it uh, at the tip of my tongue, but if you, if, you, if, if you look at the trajectory, there's no pattern that shows that lockdowns are actually the things that are keeping people alive and well. In fact, you'll find in Italy, cases keep rising, full lockdown. Spain, cases keep ri rising, full lockdown. There is no pattern. That, that can be seen. So lockdowns, there's no, there's, no, there's no empirical evidence. You can't point to one place and say cases are lowering here, therefore it works. You have to point across the board. Is everywhere lockdowns are being implemented, are cases lowering? The final point on this, another thing that has come to, come to light is the, the surfaces where the, corona, where the COVID-19 virus stays the longest, plastic, plastic, plastic surfaces. People are still allowed to go to groceries. Stores. So if somebody has the COVID-19 virus, they go to a grocery store, they hold, call for whatever, on anything plastic. Whoever comes into the shop and touches that same plastic, and nobody sanitizes the plastic bottles or the plastic anything. We sanitize our hands, yes, but that's not a full thing. So the virus is spreading indoors. 97% of the virus spreading is indoors. It's not happening outdoors. So lockdowns, there's no empirical evidence that lockdowns are actually reducing infections. Um, thanks for that question, Mantel. And allow me to say that during this season, especially in developing countries, we're going to see draconian measures infected by governments because it will be an opportunity for them to yield their power. And so we see people like uh, Boma Nusambo saying that 
I am a law to myself and I'm going to effect these things. It's because there is at some point where the government can go into a state of emergency and can allow for additional executive power, so to speak. And I'm afraid that for countries like Zambia, it's possible come next year, if uh, the onslaught goes up, it's possible we might even postpone elections unduly. But thankfully, there are, there's something we can do. There are civil society organizations and there are grants out there which are being given by Action Aid, by the Americans, by uh, Christian Aid, so that organizations can help with human rights defenses. So for those who've got a passion to do that, please look out for opportunities to uphold the rule of law in our country because there are lots of opportunities to do that. Yes, and right, just a, a quick one. Uh, um, in Hungary, okay. in Hungary, a parliament passed a decree uh, that allowed their president to, to rule by decree, meaning he can make laws without parliament's approval. So it's a very good question. We have to be very careful. We have to protect our democracy. That's why um, the statements by Bowman were unfounded and I'm very glad that even members of his own party uh, criticized, criticized him, criticized him, criticized him. Thank you, So that by 2021, this thing is done and we can have elections. If we don't put measures, we might end up having postponed elections. All right, thank you, Kosari. Thank I'm you, going Kosari. to read two questions, um, and then I'm going to ask um, Ngoma Olivia and uh, Eddie Kalaswa to ask their questions. Uh, so these two questions are going to the proposing team. Uh, so uh, JC asked uh, for the proposers, please suggest proportional measures. Uh, and then Longo Chela asked, um, is it statistically coherent and sound? To compare COVID-19 death rates in China to all other deaths put together around the world. So basically comparing the statistics in China to the statistics of uh, the entire world. Uh, I think both of these questions are to, to, the, to the proposing team. And then we're going to have Eddie and they've actually lowered their hands and uh, Olivia asked their questions. Uh, so okay, please answer, uh, answer those questions first and then uh, Eddie and Olivia will, will ask, answer the, ask their question. Is it correct to compare statistics in China to the rest of the world? Yes, because China is being used as a model. One of the worst hit provinces in China uh, can be used as a model of what may happen elsewhere. Uh, I mentioned Hubei, which has a population of 59 million. Uh, this, this is the population greater than Zambia and its population and other places. So it can be used as a model. What we were saying is, look, when you look at the worst hit places and how this virus has had an effect, uh, it's not as bad as people are making it out to be. So it's not a one size fits all kind of arrangement. Then the second, uh, the, I also wanted to mention before I go into the second question, that people are talking about Bowman, the law, whatever. Of course, that's, that's besides the debate. But that just shows you how disproportionate people are responding to the threat of COVID to the extent that now people are being irrational in their response. Case in point, Bowman. Following uh, question, what measures do you think would be proportional? To every threat in any community, people must do a cost-benefit analysis. They must analyze the threat in their society in accordance. So in Zambia, what should be done? Okay, let's not let's just pick things that, that, are, that the Western Can world- you do that about it? Right. Freddie, Freddie, please conclude. So, so in, in conclusion, what we're saying is there, let's, there's something that, that's something that can be proportionate to the threat and the, just mentioning off the cuff might not be as good as sitting down and assessing the situation locally and saying, okay, this is what's happening then. What should we do? That's my response. All right. Okay, thank you. Eddie and then Olivia. Just, just a quick, quick response on the, on the measures. Can I chip in? Uh, uh, sorry. Oh, suggesting okay. proportional measures. Yes, that question wasn't answered. Please, please quickly just answer that question. Okay, so in terms of proportionate measures, 
quarantine has never been applied to the healthy. It has always been applied to the sick. It's the first time in human history we have, we have quarantined the healthy. And so a proportional measure would be to actually quarantine the sick. Those who are at risk, because we know pre-existing conditions, you are, you are affected, breathing issues, you are affected. Those people who have such issues should be required or asked to but stay home and because of or to the change incubation period. Sort of Monsa, that's because of the incubation are you, period. We, are you going to allow the answer or, or, or not? No, it, it, it's because of the, the incubation period. So, all right, yes, but okay. People, it is because of the incubation period. It, Sorry, I'm, go I'm yeah, not going to ask yeah, you guys no, to continue debating because the I think you had has nothing a good back and forth. Uh, so I'm going to allow the audience. I'm going to allow the audience to ask their questions. Well so because of ice Eddie, cream. Eddie, and then Olivia. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, guys. That was very uh, educative. I just wanted to find out. Uh, from Freddie and Mwansa. Um, uh, firstly, uh, for, for us to really, you know, get over this COVID-19 thing, we do need a vaccine. But I just wanted to understand from your end, is your understanding of the lockdown that it's meant to stop the spread of uh, the pandemic, or it's meant to ensure that not a large number of people get the virus at the same time? Because if we have a lot of people get it at the same time, our hospitals are going to be overwhelmed and we don't want to get there. So to hold on for as long as we can until we have a vaccine, we're putting in place the lockdowns just to control how many people are getting the virus. So is your understanding that the lockdown is meant to stop the, the spread of the All right, uh, I think his question was clear. Uh, Olivia, please ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, fortunately, my uh, my question has been answered already. Thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I'm going to ask Emmanuel Kandawire and then Kalumba Wale and then Chibutu. And then after that, I'm going to allow only one more question. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll hand over back to Koza. Hi, uh, so I think my question uh, basically is uh, what is it that we are doing as a country to research the impact of COVID? COVID? Uh, because we might be applying, you know, lockdown measures which are not proportional to the impact that we are facing. Uh, already we know or we've heard that uh, malaria drugs, you know, might have uh, an effect on, uh, on, on COVID. And also we've heard that BCG you know, is being tried in Australia as a possible vaccine, that those people who have uh, undergone BCG uh, that's the TB drug, are uh, able to uh, respond positively to, uh, to, to COVID and it won't have much effect on them. But what are we doing as a country in Zambia to see whether maybe us, you know, COVID is just like a common flu. Uh, so what research are we doing? Or are we just saying, oh, America's locked down. We also let's lock down. South Africa's locked down. We also let's lock down. But South Africa doesn't have malaria. South Africa doesn't have, you know, they, they are not made in the BCG uh, as it were. So I think the question is, what measures are we doing locally uh, and not borrowing from uh, the West? For all we know, it might not be as bad as other nations. Uh, so what is Zambia and also Sub-Saharan Africa, where the impact is a little bit low? What are we doing to research this uh, the pandemic and see whether... Uh, it's not maybe as bad as it uh, ought to be. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to allow, uh, first of all, the, the opposing team, because I think they've answered less questions, to answer this question first, the one that has been asked. What are we doing as a country to understand the virus uh, in order that we, we respond proportionately to it? Uh, and then the, the proposing team is going to answer the question of what is your understanding 
of the lock, the purpose of the lockdowns? Is it to stop the spread of the virus or is it uh, to, to control it? Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for that question, uh, Uncle MK. So, you know, it's sad that uh, Zambia only this week did uh, the government release funding for the study, for the research of this coronavirus. Only this week. You know, uh, uh, the university uh, people are complaining. They're saying we don't have the funds to research. And the funds have only been released this week. And because of globalization, we don't live uh, independently. We're not an island. And sadly, when we're lagging behind in areas of research, we have to learn from countries which already have the statistics, uh, people who already are counting day by day and are already testing out these things. And that falls heavily on China and America. China, we've seen that they haven't been very truthful with their statistics already. And America is coming out in the open, giving us some recommendations. And so the best that we can do is learn from what they're doing. But I'm glad that was of this week, money has been released to find uh, people in the domain of research to find exactly how this is affecting the Zambians. It's possible, like you said, that yes, in South Africa, there's no malaria. Uh, why do we have malaria here in Zambia? So it's possible that we could have our own dynamics going on in our country. So that's where we stand. There's a fund, and in the southern region, uh, Chilu sits on the board for Southern Africa on the coordinating committee for COVID. And so they are playing a leading role to see how best to go about it. Zambia, to end, has scored the highest recoveries than any other country in the Southern Africa. And so perhaps that's a learning curve. We can pass on that information to other people on what we've done, the response, which has been proportionate. Yes, and under 10 seconds, um, in the beginning when this happened, uh, HH released a video saying we should have a full lockdown for 14 days, but the government disputed that because they wanted a, to have an approach that is proportionate and that would not affect the economy. So, uh, yeah, scalable approach. Yes, yeah. So, that's all. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, the proposing team, please answer your question. Uh, Eddie's question. Before I, before I answer Eddie's question, just a, just a quick response. One of the greatest tragedies during this entire uh, global lockdown situation that's going on is the inability of opposition political voices and media voices to call into account this thing about the lockdown. Instead, what we have is opposition leaders like HH also saying, let's lock down. Where are the voices who are calling against it? It's just a tragedy they are not there. Maybe they are. I doubt I've been looking. I have not heard many. Uh, in answer to Eddie's question about the reason for the lockdown, the lockdowns uh, had three goals. And by the, even without my own standard for judging the lockdown, based on its own three goals, it fails. The, goal, the first goal was that uh, the, origi the, the first original goal was to prevent healthcare system saturation, which is what Eddie mentioned, overloading the healthcare system. The reality, the global, right, global, because we're talking worldwide, the global healthcare system is not overwhelmed. In fact, it is being underwhelmed and damaged. Mm. Underwhelmed and damaged. I say this because if, if you knock out the hotspots, which are a minimal, it's, it's, a, it's a fraction of the places where COVID has hit. If you say the whole United States has been affected, but only New York, think of it, all the states, all the cities, it's a fraction of the healthcare systems around the nation. Italy, fraction of Europe, Spain, fraction of Europe. So the healthcare system has not been overloaded. And again, keep in mind, I'm saying the global, right? So you can mention anecdotal things about these small places, but I'm saying the global. If you said the majority of countries, I would give it to you. The second original goal was mitigation. The mitigation, let us flatten the curve of, of, uh, of infections. But the curve has been flattening for weeks according to the CDC. The healthcare system, even in New York, this according to the CDC, the healthcare system, even in New York, never came close to being overwhelmed. And yet, May 15th, 
is when they are saying that the, the lockdown should be, uh, should be uh, extended to. This is CDC information, you can look it up. And the third goal of the lockdown was so that we could determine the true mortality, mortality rate. The evidence or the reality shows, and this, as we, the more we find out about the true mortality rate, we're finding out that it is lower, not higher, but lower than expected right. because they're finding out right. more people are affected are infected okay. and are dying. So but based on the three criteria of the lockdown. All right, thanks. Just was, conclude, Monsa. That's, All right. that's it. Based on the three criteria okay. of the lockdown, it's a complete failure. Cool. All right, thank you. Uh, sorry, I am going to allow cool. for if the last... No, no, sorry. Um, that's when Chilo is asking for the link. Uh, Chilo. Uh, sorry, Henry. Mm -hmm. Oh, Please, sorry. Uh, mute your mic. All right, so I'm going to allow for the last two questions uh, for the sake of time, so we can just conclude. Uh, and these are Kalumba Wale and uh, Chibutu. So please ask your questions, and then I will hand over to Koza. I'm really just waiting for clarity on the claim that North Korea has provided statistics that are believable where historically North Korea has been known to be one of the most secretive nations in the world, even to this day. And I, an example to that fact is, currently we don't know where Kim Jong-un is. Now, if they are hiding their own head of state, what about the true statistics of this virus? So can the person that said, that cited North Korea as being transparent in their statistics kindly clarify their source of data and how they know that that is true? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chiwutu, please ask your question. All right, thank you. I think my question is um, uh, springing from the fact that I think we can see that uh, the, in fact, I shouldn't put it that way, but the, the spread of the virus may, may be curbed right now by the lockdowns and all the measures the governments are putting in place. But I think my question is um, the, uh, the IMF has reported that the, the global uh, GDP will decline uh, to 2.5% this year. And also countries like Zambia have already estimated that GDP will drop and uh, the forex, uh, the exchange rate will go up. And basically what I'm saying is that the world economy is going to suffer for the measures that are being put in place. So um, if indeed they are a good thing, uh, how far can can they be sustained? Because we know that uh, the resources that the world has uh, in terms of economic resources to be able to cater for uh, the global citizens are, are limited. They're not unlimited. And uh, as, as things are happening, production is slowed down in all sectors. And basically there's, there's going to be very little cash going around and people will not have enough resources to survive. So uh, if this is a good thing, how long can we sustain it? All right, thank you. Please answer those questions. Uh, let me answer the first and hopefully Kasiawe is an economist or lawyer, you'll answer the other one. Uh, so we must take all statistics we get with a pinch of salt. Every nation, wants to uphold the security of their nation, really. China has given us statistics, and just last week, they said we underreported by 50%. So I agree with um, the gentleman who asked about North Korea, how can we trust the statistics? But look, we get things on uh, first value. They've told us, here's what's going on there. CDC has told us, here's what's going on there. The Americans are telling us this is the death rate. In fact, let's bring it closer home. In Zambia, when we got uh, cases reported, we were all saying this is not true. In fact, even in our homes, when we sit down to discuss, we know deep down in our hearts that there are more cases than 103, 109. We've got more cases of coronavirus out there. And so let's just be cautious and uh, take all the stats with a pinch of salt and react proportionately by having these scalable measures that the government has put in place. My, my response would be that in the, uh, um, in the absence, if Henry is saying 
we should take all data with a pinch of salt, then why then respond to the unknown in a very drastic manner? You know, why should we stop our lives and hold everything? Because prevention is better than too afraid. Uh, because, and then, let me cut away. I'm not, I'm just answering your question. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's that. Then Henry asked the question, how long can this continue? Where the world shuts down its economy, uh, the, the GDP drops, it cannot continue for very long because very soon we'll start to see the drastic effect of it. If famine uh, uh, drops in, if we have also another period where there's no rain coupled with what's going on now, we'll be in a really tight spot. And especially African countries that depend on aid, that depend on loans and things like that. Because now what will happen is the IMF, the World Bank, and Western countries will use this as an opportunity to exploit us. We'll have no money. We want to get a, a euro bond or whatever, or a loan. And they'll put in all sorts of onerous measures and stringent measures. And because we have got no way of getting resources, we will bow down to them. Why? Because we did not respond proportionately to the threat. All right. Thank you. All right. At this point, uh, I am tempted to allow the last two questions I'm seeing uh, in, the, in, in the group. Uh, so Lizo Chinyama and Kozani Daka, please be very brief uh, as you ask your questions. Please be very brief. And these will be the last, uh, the last questions. And then oh, after the questions are answered, Koza, please feel free to take over. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can see my sound is working. So my, my issue uh, also is, I can see it's even in the chat right now, TK asked what's the question, was a question about a responsive, a, re a response, a uh, portion response answered. And I'll go back to what, um, what Martha said in his intro about killing the fly. Uh, so you're not going to hire an exterminator to come and kill a fly, you're going to use a fly swatter. Um, I think where um, the proposer's argument lies is in trying to convince us what this fly swatter is, which um, hasn't really been answered. We we know that we know what the what the response is right now. We know all the bad things it's causing, the hunger and everything like that. Fine, we we, we know that. But so what is a proportional response? And um, I think you need to allow. I know Mansa was trying to answer that question. You know, I think maybe you can allow him more time to try and answer it because for me, I think that's when we will be able to say, oh, okay, what we're doing actually is in, not proportional, but what you're saying is proportional. You what you started by answering with the whole let's quarantine only sick people, yeah, the kind of gets shot down by the fact that sick people, um, when they actually show symptoms, are probably infected to another people by that time. So maybe you have other, and I know some responses are probably more than just one. So maybe we can get this, what is the proportional response so that we, 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 can, we can see, um, yeah, we can see the merits of, of, of the other argument. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot uh, for, for that, the opportunity to ask this question. So um, my question is to the proposers, and this is as regards the, the notion that there's no empirical evidence that of a lockdown um, slowing down the spread of the virus. So it's said that <clears throat> after China realized that the coronavirus was more serious than it seemed, they implemented one of the most draconian mechanisms to curve or to, to slow the spread of the virus. Um, what we now understand, obviously, as a lockdown, a nationwide lockdown. Now that, that was a full lockdown. Obviously, we're, we're in a partial, lock, partial lockdown. So uh, question to the proposers, do you think that the response of China was di disproportionate at a time when they didn't even know the extent to which this virus could kill human beings? So obviously the question is about the proportion. Do you think their response at that time was dispro disproportionate um, to, uh, sorry, at the time when they didn't even know the extent to which this virus could kill human beings. Yeah, thank you. And so I'll answer the, the, the second question first. Um, the, the empirical evidence that a lockdown is working is that everywhere a lockdown has been implemented, there has been a decrease in cases. That's what empirical is. Empirical is, it can be everywhere you try it. That science is, if you're able to repeat the experiment, then the experiment is accurate. 
wherever two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atoms come together, there's water. Whether you're in China, America, that's empirical evidence. However, what we have seen world over is that places that are in lockdown, Italy, Spain, New York, cases still are rising. Places that are not in lockdown, cases are not rising at an equivalent rate, even though people are relating uh, together. So in that, that's empirical evidence by, by, by any known standard. And so you can point to one or two places where they're in full lockdown or partial lockdown, where cases are reducing, but empirical evidence requires everywhere the system is being implemented, the same results follow, and that cannot be found. Uh, in terms of a response to the, a, a proportional response, again, uh, quarantine or people who, do, people who are, uh, have pre-existing conditions, as well as they're extremely old, those who are in, in that hotspot should stay home. That's the first one. A second one is something that we have come to realize, the COVID-19 virus does not affect all people equally. I gave the example of the pregnant women who went in to deliver their babies. The, uh, a lot of them had COVID-19 and they did not even know. They had it and recovered. There's another test that was done by the Columbia University in Manhattan where they went and they found 370 homeless people people who were living on the street, and they tested their blood for COVID-19. It was found that 194 of them had COVID-19, were asymptomatic. They did not know they had it, and they recovered. This is proof evidence that by the fact that they had antibodies of the COVID-19 virus. So it is realized that it does not affect all people the same way. And so we need to look at the evidence that is coming in and, use and factor that in, into our response. It does not make sense for us to cripple our own economy, while other people are also crippling their economy, when the evidence is pointing to the fact that the majority of people are A, asymptomatic, and B, are not affected the same way by the, by, by the virus. It doesn't cripple to the same extent world over. So people who are extremely, uh, people who are susceptible, people who are in a weak spot, which we have Perfect. evidence, we know how those people, we know those systems, we know how those people can be spotted. Those people should be kept in quarantine or kept away from people so that they can have easy access to the medical services when they are required. We also need to open up the hospitals. If, I, if like I, I may, one that before Kuzwayo comes in and cuts you, uh, yes. empirical yes. evidence says 90% of the people that have COVID are recovering. It's the 10% that are dying. And this 10% have got underlining factors. Also, what's going to help us win the war against COVID is our own immune system, as Mwanta has already alluded to. It's not staying away and things like that, that the virus is going to dissipate. Because we could stay away, uh, we could be locked down. Yes, I will like, allow you two more minutes to respond to whatever question you have been given. And then from there, we have to end the debate. We are over time. So I'll allow you two minutes. Um, Freddie, you have 30 seconds to respond, and then I'll allow the other team, and then we have to end. Okay, so I'm saying, what will help us is our own bodies and the way God created us. Of course, a vaccine and things like that, but 90% of people are recovering. Not everybody with COVID is dying. Let's, 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 let's get that out of our minds. Our people are recovering and continuing with day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. So let's think about that too, because all of, a sudden, all of a sudden we just think COVID and death. That is not the case all the time. Thank you. Opposers, any response to the questions that were asked? Um, very, very quickly, I just want to, I think the question on the, uh, on the economy, we can't uh, do, implement these measures forever but we're just doing them to buy time in the interim. So while scientists are working around the clock, trying to find a vaccine, which actually takes, um, it takes a long time to, to invent, but also while they're trying to find a cure and while we're trying to learn more about this disease, we put in these measures in the interim. So it, it, it shouldn't be um, a permanent, um, yeah, it shouldn't be permanent and it shouldn't, it should be proportionate. And I think what, what we've done in Zambia is proven to be proportionate. 
Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think the takeaway is that uh, every generation has got a pandemic. Every hundred years, every century, there's a pandemic that comes. And uh, it would be blind to be ignorant of us, not to realize that this coronavirus just come, is a pandemic and come with great strength and we should uh, respond uh, rightly. When you talk to those who are older than us, they say one thing, that we've never seen anything at this level. The Vietnam War has killed more people than this. World War II has, did not kill more people than is currently being seen here. So the onslaught is great. The disease, the virus is progressing. We don't know much about it. It's, it's a new thing. And uh, the best thing to do is never underestimate an enemy. Always go prepared. I like what Lizo said. He said that the proposing team has been showing us the missiles we're using and the bullets to kill this fly. But we're not sure that in the house there's actually a fly. There's a ghost that we cannot see. We don't know how big it is. So we're not sure if maybe the bazooka is too big enough, but we know for sure that when we go in, should we find a fly, we're good. Should we find a ghost? We are still good. Thank you very much, Henry. Your time is up. Um, it's been an interesting debate. Debaters, thank you so much. Um, the audience members, thank you so much for your time. And sincere apologies for going above and beyond the agreed time that we would. But there were a lot of questions and there were a lot of points that needed to come out. So thank you so much. At the beginning of our debate, we asked the question whether you're for or against the motion. At the beginning, many of you were for the motion. After this, there will be another question posed in the group and we'll ask you to vote again and we'll have the final answer on how many of you have been swayed for the motion or how many of you have been swayed against it. Um, one of the major topics that I see coming out from this discussion was that it is a choice between whether we save an economy or whether we save livelihoods. Thank you so much for the first episode. I think it's been very, very good. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. Peace.